<laughs> Can you look in there and tell me if uh, it's not just not? Is that showing the? Uh huh. It's okay. Today uh, we're going to start talking about the exchange rate <laughs> regimes in a little bit more detail, the monetary system and the exchange rate regime. So we studied the international financial management class, then you may know about that already. I'll ask you to help a little bit. Uh, the PPT file, I need to... It's not in your notes, okay? So it will be on the website. So just look at the PPT for the first part. Use, uh, we also have a reading. So... Is there, hands up, who studies the international financial management class? One, two, three, studied before, four, five. So can you tell us what are the main three exchange rate regimes in the world? There are three exchange rate regimes, what are they? Managed, flow, and... Managed flow. Managed and fixed. What's the difference between these exchange rate regimes? Hmm? Intervention by who? So which one has the intervention? Managed and fixed. These ones both have intervention, right? Okay. What does intervention mean? Control. Control the by the woman. The it's controlled. The exchange rate is controlled by the government, okay? Or the central bank. Okay. So, what about this one, the floating one? What controls the exchange rate here? Market force. Market force, right? So, we, we talked about what kind of exchange rate did Thailand have? Originally, what kind of exchange rate did Thailand have? Mm -hmm. We have this one. Thailand was fixed to the US dollar. Okay? Then it changed. It changed to the floating one later. Okay? So countries can change the regime. So next question is how does the government intervene in the market? So controlled by the government by buying and selling currencies. Okay. So this one is controlled by market forces. People, the market buying and selling currencies. Okay. So in this case, all that's happening is that the government is joining the market. Okay. Government is getting involved in the market. That is called inter intervening. Okay. Government is also joining, playing in the market, trying to affect the market. Okay. So, why do countries have this kind of exchange rate regime? What's the advantage of this one? So we can have this one, we can have positive and negative, and these ones we can have positive and negative, right? Yes. So why do they have this one? They control the risk. Yes. They want, yes, controlled by the government, so they want a stable exchange rate. What's the, what's the advantage of having a stable exchange rate? That's the question. It eliminates the risk. Oh, so it eliminates what risk? 
Okay, so less risk for investors. How do, can you explain that? Why is there less risk for investors? For example, Hong Kong is fixed to the US dollar. Hong Kong dollar is the, always eight Hong Kong dollars is one US dollar. Like 10 years ago, eight Hong Kong dollars was one US dollar. Today, eight Hong Kong dollars is one US dollar. Why is that less risk for investors? If US investors if US investors invest in Hong Kong, they have no risk that they, they will lose money because of the chain change. of the exchange rate change. Okay, so if I invest, I buy some stocks in Hong Kong. Let's say I buy eight hundred Hong Kong dollars of stock, right? In Hong Kong. And I'm happy the stock price went up over ten years. Or let's say over one year the stock price went up by ten percent. So I'm happy. Now how much money do I have? Now I have 880 Hong Kong dollars. Okay? But I'm a US investor. How many Hong Kong dollars did it cost US dollars did it cost me to buy 800 Hong Kong dollars? Eight, uh, eight, One US dollar is eight Hong Kong dollars. One hundred. Okay? So it cost this was one hundred dollars. Okay? Then how much dollars will I get back here? 110. So I made my 10%, okay? But what happened if Hong Kong didn't have the stable exchange rate? Then it changes from 1 US dollar is equals to, 20, let's say, uh, 20 Hong Kong dollars. How much money will I get back here? 880 Hong Kong dollars. 44. Hmm? Forty-four dollars, US dollars. Am I happy? No. The stock price went up. The stock price went up in Hong Kong. I should be happy, right? <laughs> I did a good job. I invested and the stock market went up. But I only get back 44 US dollars. Why? Exchange rate change. So if we have a stable exchange rate, there's more confidence for investors. Okay? So that's what Thailand was thinking when they had the fixed exchange rate more confidence for investors, okay? So, uh, what is the negative point of the fixed exchange rates? Uh, too much reserve currency for governments. Hmm? So, the government has to use their reserve currency, and what can happen? We saw in the case of Thailand. <clears throat> what can happen when the government use all their reserve currency? If they use all reserves, they have no reserves and yes. they have to go to floating regime. They have to change their change. currency regime suddenly, right? What does that cause? Uncertainty, stability. Crisis. Crisis. Okay. Then they can have a crisis. So here we can have a crisis if the government can't maintain the peg rate. Okay. Why can countries like Hong Kong and Saudi Arabia maintain the pegged rate? They have a lot of money. They have a lot of reserve currencies, right? Saudi, what does Saudi Arabia sell? Oil. Oil, Oil right? Hong Kong does a lot of trade with the US, so they get a lot of US dollars. So they, ha they have a lot of reserve currency that they can use to protect. Do you understand? To protect your ex fixed, so they can manage the currency. Because the government has to buy and sell currencies to manage to keep the exchange rate stable, right? But what if the government doesn't have any foreign currency or gold or anything to sell? Then it can't manage the exchange rate anymore. It's going to change suddenly. Okay? But we look at it in the currency crisis, change very suddenly. Okay? So what's the advantage of the floating exchange rate system? Reflect the real economy. Hmm? Reflect the real economy. Reflect the real economy, what do you mean? Oh, yes, the economy is the growth and currency is change speedily. So it, it can adapt to the economy, you mean? Oh, yes. Mm, but it, maybe in this one, the managed flow, the government can try to adapt it to the economy a little bit better. Uh, working can avoid such like crisis. 
Yeah, so the opposite of this one, right? Yes. We don't have the sudden, we shouldn't have the sudden change in exchange rate regime. Although Switzerland recently changed from floating to fixed a couple of years ago, right? Anything else? The government don't have to spend money to control the currency. Okay, we don't have to use up our reserves buying and selling the currency, right? We're not as busy. But the most important one is another negative one here. We can control our monetary policy. So we can decide about interest rates and QE. Okay? Here we can't decide as easily about interest rates and QE. Right? We'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay? The negative is that it can be unstable, not as stable as the other one, okay? So, <coughs> we explained a little bit about that, so let's, let's just go over on the PPT. So, the, what is the international monetary system? This is the financial environment in which businesses and global investors operate. We have banking market bond market, stock markets, foreign exchange markets. Which of those is the biggest? Foreign exchange. foreign exchange markets. So if you go to any of the business websites, you'll see those markets, right? This is what we're talking about in the international monetary system. People trade a lot of bonds, they trade a lot of stocks, they trade a lot of currencies, okay? As well as other other uh, goods. Okay, so if we go to Bloomberg, we'll see the. Do you know Bloomberg? Yes. Have you been here before? So here they have markets. If we click on markets, then we can see the the, the headings. Right, we'll see uh, stocks, currencies. Commodities. What are commodities? Give me an example of a commodity. Oil, material. Oil and so on. Bonds and interest rates, right? So here we can see stocks, bonds, currencies. Okay, currencies is the main, is the biggest one, the biggest market. Okay. Uh, about four or five trillion dollars are traded every day in currencies. So, we're going to focus on that one, currency market. So what is exchange rate regime? Okay. How is the price of our currency decided? Is the price of our currency decided by market forces or by the government? Okay. That's the question we have. So, usually the US dollar after the Second World War, there was a conference called the Bretton Woods Conference, because Bretton Woods was the name of the place where they met. At that conference, there was Russia, there was France, there was the UK, there was the US, the winners of the war, Second World War, right? They were deciding about the monetary system. It used to be the gold standard. All of the currencies used to be based on gold. You could swap your currency for gold, okay? But after the war, the UK, and we talked about Keynes, he wanted to make a new world currency instead of gold, right? Like a world central bank. But the US didn't agree. They, wa they wanted to make the US dollar as the world currency, right? So basically, the US said to England and France and Russia, do you want any loans to rebuild your country after the war? Imagine. And they said, yes, please give us some loans, right? The US made the Marshall Plan. Okay, which was a big success for rebuilding Europe. So, in return, you know, they do some negotiation. The US dollar was uh, made the reserve currency in the world, right? If you look at the history, the Roman Empire, the, Ro the Greek Empire, they always controlled also the economic system after winning the wars, right? Being successful in the war is a very common. Uh, you, the U British Empire, the British pound, Right? So, these days we have the US dollar as the world reserve currency. 
If the U.S. didn't win the Second World War, would the U.S. dollar be the currency? Um, hmm? Of course, Russia won the Second World War, really. But <laughs> just the U.S. and the U.K. came in at the end and took all the credit, right? And didn't then the Russia was destroyed, so they need some loan, right? And then Russia, in my opinion, made a mistake of following the socialist system, which didn't work very well. Okay, so the U.S. became stronger. So, anyway, the currencies now is all linked to the U.S. dollar. So we have. It used to be in the first stage the U.S. dollar was linked to gold, also, but during. The 1970s, there was a war with Vietnam, so the U.S. couldn't link their currency to gold anymore. They printed a lot of currency. People didn't trust that the U.S. had enough gold to back their currency. So, the U.S. came off the gold, and nowadays we have uh, this just paper money system, not linked to gold anymore. Okay? In the 70s, one ounce of gold was about $34. Today, one ounce of gold is $1,200. If they had kept the gold standard, it would still be $34 for one ounce of gold today, but they didn't. So which would you prefer to have in your garden, gold or US dollars since the 70s? Mm -hmm. In the 70s, $34 was one ounce of gold. Now, $1,200 is one ounce of gold. Which would you prefer to have in your garden? If you made a hole in your garden and put your money there. <laughs> Gold or US dollars? Gold, right? So just we can understand that nowadays the US dollar is the world reserve currency. Okay? So we normally quote our currency with the US dollar. There's two ways, American terms and European terms quote. And this is a little bit confusing because it's the opposite to what you would think. You would think American terms means US dollar is on the left, okay? But actually, American terms US dollar is on the right, okay? Then European terms is the other way around. So American terms, the US dollar is on the right. We get $1.65 for one British pound, okay? So European terms, the other way around. So the Korean one is the Korean one quoted in European terms or American terms? American, hmm? American dollars on the left, right? Yes. Is that American or European terms? European. European terms, right? The yen, the Hong Kong dollar, Chinese yuan. If the U.S. dollar is stronger, then it's your uh, European terms. If the foreign currency is stronger, like the euro or the British pound then it's American terms. Okay. So the, most of the world's currencies is quoted in European terms. Really it's only the pound and the euro, which is American terms, stronger than the, the dollar. So here we can see the graph explaining the regime. We have no involvement by the government. The markets are deciding the exchange rate. Okay. We have a very active involvement by the government. Government is deciding, or called managing, the exchange rate. <clears throat> so, but in the real situation, it's not so black and white. Okay? Today we have minimal involvement by the government. So, for example, Japan had the earthquake. Okay? So then the government was, got involved in the currency market. So this one is not like never, government never involved. Just minimal involvement. Do you understand minimal? Yes. Minimal means rarely, very rarely. Okay. Here we have active involvement. <laughs> so Korea, is Korea a floating or a managed float? Korea is a float. Some people might say the government intervenes a lot in Korea, so it's managed float. But most people would say no, Korea is floating. So Korea is near the line. The government intervenes more often than other countries, but it's still a floating system. Okay? Still counted as a floating system. So uh, floating, just occasional government involvement, market forces, 
determine the exchange rate. Okay, we have financial institutions, banks, investment funds, companies, speculators, exporters, importers. They are all buying and selling the currencies. Who do you think in this group is the biggest buyer are the biggest buyer and seller of currencies? Look at this list. Who do you think in the market forces? Financial institutions, they are a big buyer, but there's a bigger one. Speculators, right? A lot of speculators involved in the currency market trying to make a profit. They are making a profit because exporters, do they have a choice about whether to trade currencies or not? Do exporters have a choice? No. No, they have to trade currencies, right? Companies, banks. They don't have any choice. They all have to trade currencies. Okay? So speculators don't have to trade the currencies. Speculators just do that for making a profit. That's the difference. Okay? But because the speculators know that these guys have to trade the currency, it can help them to make a profit. <coughs> so central banks may intervene occasionally. Do you think that the speculator's life, if the central bank intervenes in the market? If you're a speculator trying to make money by predicting the currency, then the central bank suddenly does something you didn't expect. Do you like that or you don't like that? Don't like okay, speculators don't like central bank intervention. And over the last few years, there's been more central bank intervention than normal. Switzerland twice changed their regime. Okay, Switzerland changed from floating to managed, back to floating again. Okay? So, some speculator and currency trading platform went out of business because they made a big bet that the Swiss franc would get stronger. And then suddenly, the Swiss central bank changed to managed regime and it got weaker. <coughs> suddenly, overnight, without telling anybody. And people lost a lot of money. Okay, traders lost a lot of money. So, central bank may intervene occasionally, uh, but uh, speculators don't like that. So, the managed currency, there is a high degree of intervention by the government. Okay? This is done on an almost daily basis. Why? The exchange rate is important to the national economy, e.g. export sector, the price of imports, or as a means to control inflation. So if we see a lot, do you know the BRIC economies? BRIC? What are the BRIC economies? Brazil, Russia, India, China, Brazil, Russia, India, China, right? What is important to the, their economies, generally? What is important to their economies? Exports. Exports, right? And are their exports price sensitive or not price sensitive? Sensitive. sensitive. Do you understand price sensitive? Yes. Mm -hmm. If you are buying a luxury BMW, are you price sensitive? Does it matter if the BMW costs 90,000 or 100,000? No. Doesn't matter. You're not price sensitive, right? Yes. But if you are buying a plastic dish for the microwave <laughs> and one costs 10,000 won and the other one costs 5,000 won, are you price sensitive? Yes. Yes, mm -hmm. yes probably you'll buy the plastic dish. It's all, it's all the same, right? There's no difference. So I'll buy the one for 5,001. So if our economy is selling products which are price sensitive, right, then the exchange rate is going to be important. If the exchange rate changes suddenly and those kind of plastic dish change its price now to 9 or 10,001, then I'm not going to buy it anymore. Okay? Because I, the price is important in that area. So if the export is price sensitive and uh, we, our economy is dependent on exports, then can you understand why we make a managed flow regime? So let me give you an example. We sell uh, t-shirts in China. Does China sell a lot of t-shirts? Mm -hmm. The t-shirt co costs $10, right? T-shirts, people wear it here. Maybe it costs just $3, right? <laughs> like you wear inside your clothes, right, or vest. So it's produced in China, right? The one in India costs the four dollars, okay? They're exactly the same almost, just a white t-shirt, okay? So China's exchange rate, suddenly, China has floating exchange rate, suddenly changed by 30%, stronger, okay? 
Lavender Chinese t-shirt also cost four dollars. Okay? So before everybody was buying the Chinese t-shirt. But now just 50% Chinese t-shirt, 50% Indian t-shirt. Okay? So we can see that the exchange rate can affect in that case the exporter if there is a sudden change. So they want a stable situation. <clears throat> so the pegged exchange rate uh, in Europe, we'll look later at the euro currency. Europe uh, has about 14 countries which are in the same currency, right? The biggest four is Germany, Italy, Spain and France. Okay? And then there's the rest of the countries are quite small. They all have the same currency, the euro. Hong Kong and Saudi Arabia, they are pegged to the US dollar, right? So governments link their currency rate to another currency. So uh, usually it can change just 1% around the other currency. So this is even stronger than the managed one. Managed one means we're just making sure our exchange rate doesn't change a lot. But fixed means we're exact, almost exactly the same as the US dollar or another country, or Germany. So, in this case, we think exchange rate is important to the country's economic development or trade. So Hong Kong is a financial center. So Hong Kong thinks a stable exchange rate is very important for them. Okay? Uh, so the price of oil is in US dollars, so Saudi Arabia wants to fix their currency to the US dollar. So they ha can be more stable about the price of oil. If their currency wasn't fixed to the US dollar, then the currency change is also going to affect the price, their income for oil, okay? So, also small countries, they can be worried about hot money. Do you understand hot money? Yes. What is hot money? Speculators can attack a small country, right? So Ireland, Ireland is a small country. So it used to be uh, managed to, against the UK pound, but now it's in the euro. Why? Because Ireland could easily be attacked by speculators. Who has more money? The Irish government in their reserves or speculators? So who's going to win if the speculators attack Ireland? Speculators might win, right? They're, they won against the UK in 1992, right? So they can easily win against Ireland, okay? So Ireland need, kind of needs to be in a, a regime which is uh, fixed to another country. So the exchange rate doesn't change too much, okay? So now Ireland is in the euro, so it can't really be attacked by speculators, okay? So here we can see uh, floating currencies and managed and pegged currencies. So uh, Canada, US dollar, Japanese yen, Australian dollar, right? Managed currencies, Singapore, Malaysia, Vietnam, and pegged currencies, Hong Kong, uh, Saudi Arabia, Oman. China is here in China's more managed flow. Okay? So uh, here we can see that uh, countries in the 1970s, they were all fixed to the US dollar. But uh, slowly, the fixed exchange rate was getting lower. Okay, some countries were getting attacked, and this is the number of countries who has a fixed exchange rate. They were leaving the fixed exchange rate system, like Thailand, right? Around 1996, Thailand decided to leave the fixed exchange rate system. Okay. A couple of countries came back. We had the euro started here. So all the euro countries joined the fixed exchange rate system. So, anyway, less than 50% of countries have the fixed exchange rate system. So, you, do you know this graph, supply and demand? So we can, we have a simple supply and demand uh, graph for the exchange rate. So here we have, if we increase the demand for a currency, what's going to happen? Currency will get stronger or weaker? Stronger. Okay. If we increase 
if we decrease the supply, it's the same. Okay, we decrease, it's not a that normal situation to decrease the supply. We could destroy the money, but maybe increase the interest rate to decrease the supply. So this is uh, going to reduce the interest rate. Or sorry, uh, make the currency stronger. So if we, the opposite, if we decrease the demand or increase the supply, what's going to happen to the exchanges? <coughs> Get weaker, right? So we have to ask then what can change demand or what can change supply, right? So the short-term interest rate can affect the uh, demand. So if we have, if we in the short term, if Hana Bank makes a higher interest rate than Shinan Bank, which bank are you going to deposit your money in? Now Shinan Bank and Hana Bank both have two percent interest. Hana Bank increases interest to three percent. Which bank are you going to deposit your money in? Hana Bank. Hana Bank. Why? Because they can. They're paying you more interest, right? Yeah. So if we increase the interest rate for the currency, what's going to happen to demand in the short term? Increase demand and the currency will get stronger, right? Uh, inflation. Okay, if we have low inflation, there's going to be increased demand for our currency. Economic growth. Our economy is doing very well. We can get increased demand. Why? Our economy is going well. China's economy is growing a lot. I want to start a factory in China. Start a business in China. What do I need to start a factory in China? I need Chinese currency. Okay, so I'm going to demand Chinese currency. Okay. Uh, the safe haven effect can affect demand. When there's a crisis, uh, people try to invest in a safe country. What, what are safe countries? Zimbabwe. In the crisis, invest your money in Zimbabwe. It will be safe there. No, where? The US? Switzerland? Anywhere else? Germany. Okay. So here we can see... Uh, in the World Trade Center attack, okay, then all of these currencies appreciate against the US dollar because they're, you know, the US, people thought the US economy might have some problem after the attack. So they went to the other currencies. They went to uh, Swiss franc or the euro. We can see the Swiss franc was the one which has the biggest appreciation. So Swiss franc is generally seen as the Switzerland is a neutral country up in the mountains. Okay, not much is going to happen there. So governments can intervene. If governments feel their currency is too weak, what do they need to do? Buy the currency, right? If the government thinks their currency is too strong, what are they going to do? Sell their currency the supply okay so discuss with your partner use this model to explain how, how a central bank can respond to a weak currency and a strong currency so just make the graph or draw the line make the simple graph and explain to your partner we have a problem our currency is too weak or our currency is too strong okay what are we going to do we just explained on the last slide so in, explain with the graph, the supply and demand graph. So use this graph to explain to your partner. Currency is too weak, what is the government or central bank going to do? Then draw it on the graph. Currency is too strong, what is the central bank going to do? Draw on the graph.
Why didn't you answer at the start? You're thinking too deeply? <laughs> Are we move, move? To Sanyas? Okay, so if the currency is too weak, we need to do something. If the currency is too strong, we need to do something. What are we doing? How does it affect supply and demand, right? So, first of all, what are we doing if the currency is too weak? What do we need to do? How are we going to do that? Hmm? How are we going to increase demand for our currency? To increase uh, interest rate. Increase the interest rate or sell, simply? Sell all currency. Sell your currency is increasing demand or supply? Sell the currency is demand. Supply. If you sell your currency, are you increasing you demand for your currency? No. We should buy. Buy your currency. Buy. And what about too strong? What should you do? So, sell your own currency, right? So, Trey uh, Jinu, can you draw up here on the graph what should happen? You have the black pen is too weak, the blue pen is too strong. Both of them are too weak and too strong. What's going to happen? Black one is too weak. <coughs> so what's that? It means government getting down to the supply and price go up. So decrease the supply, how are they going to do that? Hmm? What else can the government do? They can decrease the supply by increasing their interest rate. What else are they going to do more normally? <laughs> yeah. So you, the first one, is, there's something else they're going to do. So just on the first one, on the black one, they can either decrease supply is correct, but what else can they do? What's the, what's the same as decreasing supply? Increase demand. 
So you can draw that line on the on the demand. Sorry, I, I have mm -hmm. no idea about the demand side. You're not sure about the demand side. You just know the supply side. Okay. The supply side. What's in going to do? Draw a line here. So no, we already said that this one is not. Our so, what what is that that you are doing there? I'm oh, sorry. I think I sorry. I wrote on the wrong one. Right? Demand is here. Right? So you're also again decreasing supply. So what's that? Well, the cost is too extreme. You have to increase the demand. Increase the demand, okay. And what happens to the price? Increase. Price goes up, okay. So how do you increase the demand? Increase the Buy our own currency, right? What do we use to buy our own currency? Bananas. What do we use to buy our own currency? Uh, government what? Reserves. Reserves, right? Gold or other currencies. Okay, and then in the second case where it's too strong, what are we going to do? We use the blue pen. <clears throat> so what's that? You're again working with demand. I, it's better to do something with the supply line. So if our currency is too strong, what do we want to do? Increase the price or decrease the price? So is that correct? Are you decreasing the price? If we decrease supply, what's going to happen to the price? If, I, if we are talking about the housing markets and we have a low supply of houses, is the price going to go up or go down? With lower supply, price goes down? Lower supply, price goes up. Yes. So we want, the problem is our currency is too strong. We want to make it weaker. We want the price to go down. So if we want the price to go down, what do we need to do? So, in the housing market, the government builds more houses, <coughs> they increase the supply, is the price going to go up or down? If the government builds more houses, is the price going to go up or down? Yes, there's more supply, the price will go down. So you're saying now that less supply, the price will go down? Is that correct? <laughs> So where the blue line meets the red line, right? That's the line. <laughs> so what did you do? You want the price to go down. You want the price of houses to go down. Are you going to increase the supply of houses or decrease the supply of houses? Increase. You want the price of your currency to go down. What are you going to do? Increase. Hmm? In increase the supply. 
Increase the supply, okay? How are you going to increase the supply? Low interest rate. Of your currency. How are you going to increase the supply of your currency? Hmm? How are you going to increase the supply of houses? Build more houses, right? How are you going to increase the supply of your currency? Okay. We're going to sell our currency. We can print and sell our currency. Does anybody have any questions about this graph? Is it clear that when we increase the supply, the price goes down? Yes? Yes. So normally, in the currency market, it's, this is what we do. We have a choice. We could decrease demand, right? Price would go down. Okay? But that's not as easy to manage. The easier thing is increase supply. If you think about the housing market, you want cheaper houses, which is easier to do. Decrease demand. Just send all the people to another country. No. No. Or increase supply. Increase supply. Increase supply is easier, right? What about, uh, it's the same in the currency market, right? Increasing supply is easier. What about demand? Okay, uh, we increase demand. What's going to happen to the price? Goes up, right? So we want to buy our currency to make the price go up. Okay, we can see sometimes in, in the housing market, in the crisis, the banks buy the houses from the developers that can't sell the house. Because the bank wants to keep the price high of houses. Right? If the price goes too low, the bank would have a problem. So sometimes the banks buy from the developer. The government, in Ireland, the government bought all the properties. They, because they made a fund to buy up all the properties. Because they didn't want a fire sale of properties. Do you understand fire sale? So the government in Ireland wanted to increase the price of the properties. So. <laughs> Basically, in Ireland you have more people who own houses than don't hold houses. I didn't agree with that policy because obviously for young people it's better if the, we have cheap houses. But the older people is running the country, right? <laughs> they all own houses. Yeah. So they want to increase the price of houses. So the government bought all the houses off the market, right? <coughs> and left them empty. Nobody living in them. Right? So that the price would be increased. That's democracy, right? <laughs> Majority rules. Majority own house, they want to keep the house empty, then to keep the house price high, they can do that, right? They're going to vote for politicians who will do that. So similar with currency. Government is going to buy the currency to keep the price of their currency high. Okay, so then do you have any question about what we studied today? Oh, so we have a reading here, which we'll discuss in the next class, and you can read before the next class. Uh, <laughs> so the reading is... Uh, exchange rate regimes, week 10, it's in the readings. So we're, we'll look at it in the next class, but you can read also before the next class. It, it explains, it's just a few pages, explains here about, explains about floating exchange regime, explains about managed float, and explains about the fixed exchange rates. Okay? So you can read this one to prepare for the next class. Okay. Exchange rate regimes in reading. Thank you.